Welcome to Assessing the Geriatric Psychiatric Patient in the Ambulatory Setting, Approach to Dementia Assessment. I'm Dr. Steven Scheinthal, Associate Professor of Psychiatry here at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, School of Osteopathic Medicine. This presentation is supported by an educational grant from the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation Aging and Quality of Life Program. The learning objectives for today are to identify the major components of a dementia assessment and their role in determining an appropriate diagnosis and treatment strategy. To distinguish and diagnose four major types of dementia including Alzheimer's, vascular, frontal temporal, and Lewy body, and to appropriately recognize and diagnose dementia and depression in the older patient. When a patient presents to your office for assessment, there are several key components that you need to cover, and they are listed here. When a patient is in your office, the chief complaint is what the patient reports. It's also what the family or caregiver may report and should include the patient's understanding of why they're in your office today. When establishing the history of the chief complaint, it's important to look at the timeline, how the problem is impacting the patient's daily function. Collateral information may or may not be available when you see the patient for the first time. It is always best to see the patient alone at first. This helps to establish the doctor-patient relationship and also helps to avoid family dynamics during history taking. In addition, it allows the patient privacy. Next, we'll take a look at the past medical history. We should look for how that correlates with the patient's physical and mental illness and are there any patterns that we see. When looking at the patient's past psychiatric history, is there a pattern of prior disease? That is, is there always a seasonal aspect? Do anniversaries, birthdays, change in seasons bring out a pattern to the disease? You should always be considering risk factors, prior suicide attempts, prior physical or psychiatric hospitalizations. What is their patient's treatment history? Has treatment been successful? Do they go to a doctor once or twice and then not go back? And why might that be? Today, we're going to take a look at the case of Mrs. B. When we take a closer look at the case of Mrs. B, she comes in and she says, I'm very upset about coming here. My daughter made me come. She thinks I'm losing my mind. What we know is this is a 72-year-old female who is very angry and tearful when describing her history. She admits to losing things and getting lost driving once. I, I got lost because of, because of the construction. She states, I, I'm able to do the cooking, but she also admits that she has left a pot burning on the stove on more than one occasion. She doesn't know how long this has been happening. Let's consider the question, what is confabulation? Let's take a moment to think about this. Confabulation is the creation of false memories. This is commonly seen in patients suffering with Alzheimer's disease. It fills the gaps in the patient's memory. It can be difficult to distinguish confabulation from lying or even from delusions. 
Let's next turn our attention to the question, why is collateral information important? Collateral history becomes very important when a patient is confused, since the history from the patient is not always reliable. When evaluating someone with cognitive issues, family and friends, even caregivers, can be helpful in verifying the accuracy of the patient's report. Let's turn back to the case of Mrs. B. Here we get collateral information from the daughter. Her daughter reports that Mrs. B is increasingly confused and angry, that the confusion has been escalating over the past year. Mrs. B, a lady who was very good with names and remembering birthdays, sending cards to relatives and friends regularly, has now been forgetting names and frequently missing birthdays. She's also noted now to be making up stories that are just not true. Twice she's gotten lost coming home and there was no construction. She's burned several pots on the stove. She's not sleeping well. She has a poor appetite and is picking at the food. We see her past medical history here and her daughter reports that Mrs. B has no prior history of depression. Her social history is that she is a retired teacher with a college education. She has been widowed for 10 years and has three children and seven grandchildren. She lives alone. She drinks two or three glasses a week of wine and she enjoys that. She denies any other drug use. Mrs. B has no advanced directive. When we take a closer look at her medications, it's always important to do a medication reconciliation, that is, a review of her medications to look for things that may be causing problems or creating a prescribing cascade. Here we see her current medications as well as her over-the-counter medications. We have to question the Ambien use, but other than that, her medications appear reasonable. Let's take a closer look, however, at common prescribing cascades. A prescribing cascade is where a medication is prescribed for the side effect of another medication. Here are some common prescribing cascades. For example, with a SSRI, we can get serotonin syndrome which presents as agitation and restlessness. The prescribing cascade would be to prescribe an antipsychotic or a benzodiazepine to decrease the restlessness or the agitation. The treatment of choice, however, would be to remove the SSRI. SSRIs can also contribute to insomnia. This can lead to the prescribing of sleep aids. Yet again, the better treatment would be to remove the offending agent causing the insomnia rather than adding additional medication. Appetite change likewise can lead to the prescribing of appetite stimulants which also carry a host of side effects. We also see prescribing cascades commonly with benzodiazepines which can cause lethargy, agitation, and depression we know that the lethargy can lead to the prescribing of psychostimulants, the agitation to the prescribing of antipsychotics, and the depression to the prescribing of antidepressants. All could be readily treated by removing the offending benzodiazepines. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors as well are a common source of prescribing cascades. These medications are not benign. They commonly cause restlessness, insomnia, bradycardia, or weight loss. For example, bradycardia can lead to syncopal episodes, which can then lead to a cardiac workup and even pacemaker placement, insomnia to prescribing of sleep aids, and so on. Please be aware of common prescribing cascades and do your best to not contribute to this problem. Let's turn our attention to the physical exam in the case of Mrs. B. 
The physical exam in psychiatry is the mental status exam, and it has several key components. Appearance, speech, affect and mood, thoughts, sensorium and cognition. The mnemonic ASATS may help you remember these important components. In the case of Mrs. B, we find a 71-year-old female who appears much younger than her stated age. She is nicely dressed and well-groomed, she ambulates with a steady gait, and she has no tremor. Her speech is clear, spontaneous, and goal-directed with no noted pressure. Her mood is angry, and she has an angry, upset affect. She has no suicidal or homicidal ideations and likewise denies any auditory or visual hallucinations. There are no looseness of associations, no flight of ideas, no ideas of reference, and no paranoia noted with this patient. She is alert and oriented times too, that is to self and place, but not date. Her short-term memory is limited, but her long-term memory is quite good. She is able to register three out of three items with a recall of one out of three. Her mini mental status exam shows a score of 21 out of 30. Her insight and judgment are noted to be fair. When screening for mental status issues, there are several screening tests that are available. Their sensitivity and specificity are listed here. It is important to remember that all of these tests are screening tests and none of them are diagnostic. Diagnosing dementia in a patient is a clinical diagnosis and you cannot rely on any one tool to make that diagnosis. When we look at the laboratory tests for Mrs. B, we see that they're all within normal limits with the exception of her cholesterol. We know that she has hyperlipidemia and that she is receiving treatment for her hyperlipidemia. However, her laboratory values reflect that this is still not under good control. The CAT scan of her head shows no focal lesions and is reported to have age-related atrophy. In addition to the CAT scan, there are other neuroimaging tests that could have been included. They are listed here. It's important to note that with a negative CAT scan, there would not be a reason to order additional neuroimaging. PET scanning is now Medicare approved, but may not be available in all areas. The next generation of PET scanning is called co-registration, and these machines have CAT scanning and PET scans integrated together. This allows for both anatomic and metabolic imaging simultaneously. Does Mrs. B have dementia? Well, she has progressive memory loss. She's showing impairment in her instrumental activities of daily living. There is impairment in her planning and the impairments are affecting her functioning. But we do need to rule out other medical illnesses here. When looking at patient dementia subtypes, I find the terms cortical and subcortical helpful when talking about symptom clusters. In cortical symptoms, we find symptoms that are focal. We see language difficulties, particularly with aphasia and anomia. Visual spatial difficulties are also seen. Apraxias and agnosias are seen, as is difficulty in learning new information. Subcortical symptoms include memory deficits, slowing of processing. Frequently you see a change in personality and a difficulty in retrieving new information. When considering types of dementia, dementia of the Alzheimer's type is the most common type of dementia. It has an insidious onset with a progressive course. These patients may be apathetic. They have executive function difficulties, problems in both planning and organizing. They frequently confabulate. You see 
aphasias, agnosias, apraxias, and anomias in the course of the disease. Late in the disease, you may see rigidity, gait disturbance, seizure disorders, total aphasia, that is the patient may not be able to speak whatsoever, and dysphagias or trouble swallowing. The DSM-IV-TR criteria for dementia talks about under A2 having one or more of the following cognitive disturbances. In addition, the course of dementia in the C criteria needs to be gradual in onset and continuous. In the D criteria, we want to be certain that the symptoms are not due to an other CNS problem that they're not due to what may be a reversible cause of dementia or an infectious process such as neurosyphilis or HIV or due to a substance. Finally, you want to be certain that the deficits are not caused because of a delirium and that the disturbance is not better accounted for by a symptom of depression or schizophrenia or another Axis one disturbance. When considering frontal temporal dementia or PICS disease, these dementias have behavioral changes. These patients are often disinhibited. They're impulsive. They can be very intrusive. They too have executive dysfunction. They also have judgment changes as well as anomia and aphasia. Lewy body dementia has yet a different cluster of symptoms. These patients have sleep disturbance, often auditory and or visual hallucinations. They may seem very flat or have a masked facies. Rigidity or Parkinsonism is not uncommon. Of note, the symptoms associated with Lewy body dementia often get worse when these patients are given antipsychotics. In vascular dementia, these patients will have notable vascular risk factors. The onset of the disease is often abrupt and may progress in a stepwise fashion. Depression is not uncommon here, nor are focal neurologic symptoms. In addition, these patients, while they have a preserved awareness of their surroundings, may display urinary incontinence, gait disturbance, depression, and can also have psychotic symptoms. Parkinson's disease, too, may progress on to a dementia in 40% of the people affected. These people often are apathetic and depressed. They have psychomotor slowing in addition to their gait disturbance. Visual hallucinations that are typically reported as small animals or human forms are common. Delusions here are not uncommon. These patients may in fact respond well to acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Clozaril is reported to be the treatment of choice for psychosis associated with Parkinson's disease. It is recommended to start at the lowest possible dose, 12.5 milligrams at bedtime. The smallest pill available of Clozeril is 25 milligrams, so you're talking about half of the smallest available dose. Before considering one of the types of dementia we've just reviewed, a question you should consider is whether the dementia is reversible. Let's take a moment to think about that. The reality is very few dementias are reversible. 0.29% of all dementias are partially reversible. 0.31% are fully reversible. Some reversible causes of dementia include medications, infections, tumors, However, what we do know is that 50 to 60% of dementias are of the Alzheimer's type. 
and almost half of people into their 80s will develop some form of cognitive disorder. When considering the difference between depression and dementia, this chart may be helpful during the course of your careers. When looking at memory in depression, people may have trouble concentrating, while in dementia they have trouble storing new information. Orientation in depression is normal, while in dementia it's often impaired. Language function in depression is normal, while word finding deficits in dementia are not uncommon. The use of objects in depression is normal, while in dementia you frequently see apraxias. Thoughts in depression may be negative, but in dementia you often find confabulation or space filling when the patient can't identify what the thought actually is. Let's turn our attention to the relationship between dementia and depression. Depression may in fact be a prodromal symptom of dementia. Depression could be a risk factor for dementia. An untreated depression may progress onto dementia. What we do know is that more research is required on this important relationship between depression and dementia. Turning back to the case of Mrs. B, is Mrs. B depressed? Well, we know she is angry, upset, and frustrated, and she has an acute reason for this. She was brought to an appointment she doesn't want to be at. What is missing are the DSM-IV-TR criteria for depression. While she denies feeling depressed, she does admit that she gets tearful from time to time. And the collateral information from her daughter does report decreased sleep and decreased appetite. When evaluating an older adult in our office, it is important that we always ask the question, what is the potential risk of suicide? Let's take a moment to think about this. We know that older adults, particularly the 85 and over group, are at the highest risk for completing suicide. The red flags for a patient who is at risk are listed here. It's important to remember that older adults often will minimize their feelings and may not report that they are depressed or even contemplating suicide. There have been studies that show that people who killed themselves saw their family doctor within a month before the suicide and made no reports of feeling depressed or of their intent. Turning back to the case of Mrs. B, in order to come up with a diagnosis, we need to consider the following questions. Is the course of her illness subacute or chronic? In the case of Mrs. B, we know that her course is chronic. Is the course of steady decline or is it stepwise? Well, in the case of Mrs. B, we know that her course is steady. Is the syndrome cortical, that is impaired language, memory, visual, spatial problems, or is it subcortical, impaired motor function, apathy, change in personality? And in this case, we know that her course is cortical. Was her first symptom cognitive or non-cognitive? And we know it was cognitive. Are extrapyramidal symptoms present here? And the answer is no, they are not. When turning to a diagnosis, given the current information, I would call Mrs. B dementia not otherwise specified with a probable dementia of the Alzheimer's type with depression. The depression here is not that she meets DSM-IV-TR criteria for major depression, but she does have some depressive symptoms, not eating well, not sleeping well, and tearfulness. 
I would defer diagnosis on axis two. As you know, we should not diagnose personality after a first meeting with any patient. On axis three, we know she has hyperlipidemia, osteoporosis, and migraines. Because we are coding dementia of the Alzheimer's type with depression on axis one, we also need to include that it is a probable diagnosis here as well. On axis four, we know she has social stressors, she is widowed and she lives alone, and she's on a fixed income, which gives her financial stressors. Her axis five is a 55. We next have to consider, will Mrs. B require services in order to stay at home? Let's take a moment to think about this. We know that she is having significant dysfunction in her instrumental activities of daily living. She has gotten lost, she's burned pots. We at the least should be referring her for a driving evaluation. And cooking really should be done at this point only under supervision due to the burning of the pots. Mrs. B admits that she drinks several times a week and we have to wonder, is she safely administering her medications? A social service consult here is critical to address safety both with the patient and with her family. I would break Mrs. B's plan into short-term considerations and long-term considerations. On the short-term side, I would like to get neuropsychiatric testing done within a month. This would help to establish a better cognitive baseline on Mrs. B and may identify specific areas of deficits that we're not already picking up. In addition, I would like to see a driving evaluation done due to the fact that she admits she is getting lost. Also in the short term, I would like a thorough social work assessment that would look at the safety in her home, her medication safety, Mrs. B's access to community social service agencies, and to begin to address advanced care planning both with Mrs. B and her daughter. From a long-term perspective, I would consider the addition of an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor to help slow her decline and aid in functioning. A minimal trial on these types of medications is six months. Here, I would recommend starting Aricept five milligrams a day for 30 days, and then increase Mrs. B to 10 milligrams once a day. I would be monitoring for change in sleep, change in appetite, particularly a decrease in her appetite, any increase in agitation or restlessness, and for bradycardia or syncopal episodes. And I would discuss this with Mrs. B's daughter as well. Also, from a long-term perspective, I would recommend decreasing her Ambien from 10 milligrams to five milligrams at bedtime. I would also monitor for change in her sleep patterns. And at her next follow-up visit, I would like to reassess the need for this medication altogether. I would also like to bring Mrs. B back in about four to six weeks. Should Mrs. B be on any additional psychoactive medication? Let's take a moment to think about that. It's important to remember that not every patient needs to be on psychoactive medication. You should always resist the temptation to place people on medications without a clear indication and without clear diagnostic criteria for the medication. When we're treating elderly patients, we always need to weigh the side effect risk against the benefit, and care has to be taken to avoid prescribing cascades in this population. In the case of Mrs. B, we do not know if she's really angry or if the anger is just situational. She didn't want to come to the doctor. She's having friction with her daughter. 
her behavioral mood symptoms may be related to the current situation or they may in fact be depressive symptoms and frustration due to her forgetfulness from her dementia. There is no way to know this at this point in time. When she comes back for her follow-up visit in four to six weeks, we can better reassess her mood. We will have already established a doctor-patient relationship and she may be less resentful about coming in for a visit. At that time, we can better consider the need for an antidepressant. If she is still tearful, still not sleeping well, still not eating well, we may next consider the addition of Celexa 10 milligrams in the morning and we'll discuss with both Mrs. B and her daughter that we would need to wait a minimum of 10 to 14 days before we would see any effect in her mood. The following pearls may be helpful for you as a summary of what we have covered today in this presentation. I'd like you to remember that dementia is a clinical diagnosis and that you do need, no matter how rare they are, to exclude the reversible causes of dementia. Also remember that collateral information can help to confirm or dispel what the patient is telling you and in addition may be an important source of additional information. Distinguishing between depression and dementia can be difficult you may not be able to adequately separate these two diagnoses in one visit and a repeat or follow-up visit may be necessary to better determine the diagnosis. It's important to note the patient's level of functioning both prior to them coming in and their current level of functioning. You should always be assessing safety in your office patients and whenever possible engaging social services to help provide an additional support system for the patient and their families. I hope this presentation will provide you with additional information that will improve the quality of care you are delivering to your older patients.